when I was in pastoral ministry, most of uh, my life I've been in pastoral ministry. It was in January 1st of 2006 when I went to work with Randy Clark and Global Awakening. And it's too long of a story to, to go through, but it was uh, a wonderful journey. We were a church in revival. Like I said, most of my time was in Florida in pastoral ministry. Since then, I've been working with Global. Um, I also heard this morning how to describe Pat. Um, Pat has been, been with me since 1996 or so. Um, had him, he worked for me when I was pastoring. He left, and then I actually hired him again. He is over our international ministries trips. I didn't learn my lesson the first time. But what was it you said about the guy who came up? It was like a rash that wouldn't go away or something. Uh, 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 it was so... I, I realized what Pat was to me. Uh, but but uh, it was, it's a good rash. It doesn't itch too bad. So uh, I'm married, have two children, a uh, 44-year-old daughter, be 44 uh, on Thanksgiving Day, and then I have a 41-year-old son. I got married when I was 10. So if you're trying to <laughs> figure out how old I am, that will give you a, a little bit of a hint. What I want to talk about this morning with the time that we have is living a supernatural lifestyle and doing it in a natural way, not in a religious way, but as we walk out our lives for the Lord, living it in a supernatural way. Now, I'm going to try not to talk too fast because my accent is a little bit different than yours. Um, sometimes I go to places where English is the major language, but I need an interpreter because I don't understand the accent. So hopefully my southern accent is not too bad and you'll be able to follow the things that I want to share with you today. So I want to talk about living a supernatural lifestyle. And I want to start with 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. It's a very simple verse. I usually do a little bit, more, uh, spend a little more time laying a foundation, but I also want to try to leave time for prayer at the end. So whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him, which means whoever claims to, believe, believe, uh, to be a believer, they're going to walk out their walk as Jesus walked out his. They're going to live their lives the same way he lived his. Now, this is not meant in any way as condemnation. That's not, I, I, don't, I don't speak condemnation, I don't bring condemnation, but I try to bring awareness of things that we may need to, to work on, we might need to improve on. And by the way, uh, I did think of something else. Uh, the scripture that was read, uh, John t um, Matthew, of uh, the talents, was that the one? Okay. Uh, I, I, there's something that the Lord has been giving me for a while to pray over people. I, not everybody, but there will be people that I'll sense and I'll pray it over them, is that, Lord, this person has been faithful to what you've given them to do so you can trust them with more. And as she was reading that scripture, it just leapt into my spirit, into my heart, that this is the kind of church you are, that you've been faithful in what God has given you to do so he can trust you with more. So he's going to be trusting you with the more, the more than you already have. So instead of it being a, a two-talent or a five-talent, you're going to be a ten-talent church. Now, what that means, I'm not exactly sure, except it was what the Lord spoke into my heart. So be encouraged with the scripture that was read this morning. All right, so how did Jesus walk out his life when he was here on earth? We could name a whole bunch of things. I could take you through the scriptures. Usually I, I do this teaching in about an hour, and I could, I could just walk you through a whole long list of things that the Lord did. And, and, and when I, I used to hear this scripture taught on as growing up in a Pentecostal church. Um, and when they would talk about this scripture, it was all about the way you dressed. How many of you are from a traditional Pentecostal background where it was legalism? Anybody? Okay, three or four of you. I thought so. Uh, I grew up in a very legalistic church. When they would talk about living life like Jesus did, it was all about you couldn't go to movies, you couldn't go to the ball game, you couldn't go swimming with girls. Well, they called it mixed bathing. Uh, and I said, I never took soap, so it was legal for me to go swimming with a, a, a girl. 
So we had, you know, you couldn't cut your hair, you couldn't wear makeup, you couldn't wear jewelry. In fact, my wife and I didn't get married with uh, wedding bands because you weren't supposed to wear jewelry. And so I grew up in that kind of legalistic uh, setting where when they talked about living life like Jesus lived, it was all legalistic. And I, I believe we ought to live, live good moral lives. I really believe that. But I, what, I think what the Scripture is telling us here is to live life like Jesus lived, which was doing the miraculous. It, it includes all the other things. Uh, preaching the good news to the poor. Healing the sick. Casting out demons. Raising the, bed, uh, raising the dead. Raising the bed as well. But raising the dead. Some should have been raised from the bed this morning. B-E-D, not D-E-A-D. Uh, although I have been in congregations where I felt like I was trying to raise the dead. But that's neither here nor there. So I think we, in fact, the scripture actually literally means the test of our religious experience, the test of our Christianity is, are we living life as Jesus lived his? Now, I love the church. Most of my life has been in pastoral ministry. I love the body of Christ. I love the church. I love the church setting. But Jesus didn't do his ministry inside the four walls of a building. I'll try it over here. Uh, <laughs> Jesus didn't live, do his ministry inside the four walls of a building, did he? Yeah. He, he, he? He was out on the streets. He was with the people. And so the focus of this, this uh, message is about living a supernatural lifestyle outside the four walls of the church. It's easy to pray for the sick where there's a good environment and the right music and the atmosphere is right and the lights are just right. It's, it's much easier to pray for the sick in a setting like that than it is to grab someone off the street. Now, I know that you may already be outside of the four walls of the church. This may be a focus for, for you already. If that is the case, then this is just going to be a reminder. If it's not the case for you as an individual, I want to encourage you to allow... Holy Spirit to live through you where you work, where you go to school, as you're at market, wherever you are, he has something he wants to, to use you for. He wants to, he wants to touch that person through you. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Southern California. They have developed a pill. Now this is a tic-tac. Some of you will say you need more than what you're about to have. Southern California has developed a pill that is a cure for every disease. It doesn't matter what it is. Every emotional disease, every physical disease, every situation in your life, Southern California has created this pill. Except the scientists, they don't spread it to the community. They invite a few friends to come, take the pill, they might invite a few of their neighbors to come by and get a, one of the pills to take. How would we feel about a company who developed a pill that would cure cancer, cure every disease, every ill, and they kept it to themselves? What would we say about them? See, I find that there are churches who have the answer, which is Jesus, but they don't want to spread it outside of their, the few that they know. Now, again, I can tell that this is not a church like that. You'll thank me later. See, there's a, there's a Japanese art form um, called kintsuji. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, but it's where uh, if you break a, a vase or a, a bowl or a pitcher of, that you would pour water or tea out of, you break that, that bowl, and then they go to great effort to put it together with molten gold or silver or, or metal with gold dust sprinkled in it. And so they take and they will put this bowl back together. And they'll do it, they will, they'll do it with expensive bowls. And sometimes it takes months for them to put the pieces of this bowl back together. Uh, usually I'll have a photograph of one that, so you'll know what I'm talking about because most all of us have seen one of these bowls. And so this, you'll see this bowl, but it'll be put back together, not with glue, but it'll be put back together with gold or silver. And what happens is this new bowl that's made out of the broken pieces is actually more valuable than the original piece was. 
See, there are broken people in our community that need help in being put back together. And once they are put back together, they're more valuable than they were even before they were broken. Now, I, I, I wrote down a couple of thoughts. First is you, you should never throw away broken objects. And, I, and when I say object, I'm meaning people. should never throw away broken people. Secondly, we should try to repair things because sometimes in doing so, we obtain more valuable objects. And then thirdly is we should help people look for a way to cope with traumatic events in a positive way, to learn from the negative experiences. Now, it's easy for me to say that. It's challenging for people to get over traumatic events. I, I meet people who, who have experienced events in their lives that I don't know how they make it. But it's our, one of our responsibilities is to help put back the pieces of that broken person. We, we have a commission to go and do that. And if we're going to live our life as Jesus lived his, then we're going to help put broken people back together. And in fact, ultimately, these, these ugly breaks, these breaks in these people's lives, are not, they're not scars. They're actually they're evidence of the restoration of Jesus. When you look at a person who's been put back together and, and help people to think this way, that they're not, they're not ugly scars, but they're just enhanced beauty marks of the restoration of Jesus. Because when Jesus puts someone back together, there's a beauty that exists there. You will find that people who have walked through tragedy in their lives, whether it's divorce or, or, or cancer or whatever it is, you'll find that they have much greater patience with others who have been broken than those of us who haven't had those kinds of experiences. One of the things that I so appreciate about the Lord is He uses those things that the enemy means for evil. He turns around and uses them for good. And so those scars that some of us carry that we're ashamed of are really not ugly scars, but the enhanced beauty marks of the restoration of Jesus. And we don't need to hide them. I know that there, I, I, I meet people who are embarrassed about specific things. And, and I understand there, there are certain settings and certain things that you should keep. You don't want to spread. But those things you can be, be, be able to share them. Because it may bring healing to someone else. You may be that Japanese artist who ex, is, is practicing kintsuji by putting together those broken pieces. Now, why, why do we need to live a supernatural lifestyle? First one, let me jump ahead here. And by the way, I, I wonder sometimes, and don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but I wonder sometimes if the greatest tragedy of life, it, it's not the sins that we commit, it's, it's not the things that we do wrong, but it is the life that we fail to live. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. But we sometimes are so focused on the things that we've done wrong that we, that we, we're so, we, we lose focus of living the life that Christ has called us to live. I wonder if we, when people stand before the Lord and however that appears in your belief system. I don't know what you think about eschatology. I don't know what you think about end times. Mine changes from, you know, Whoever I heard last, you know, I think they preached on end times. That sounds great. The next person preaches, well, that sounds great. And they preach two different things. So for me, it seems to depend on who I heard last. But I, I wonder if the greatest tragedy is not going to be the things that we did wrong, but how disappointing would it be to find out the Lord had so much more for us to live than we actually lived out while we were here on earth. So I think maybe the greatest tragedy is the life that we failed to live. Why do we want to, why is this lifestyle important? Why is living a supernatural lifestyle important? First, it draws people to Christ. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. You don't have to turn there. It says, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Living a supernatural lifestyle draws people to Christ. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. The words that we speak are, are important. The message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is important. So we need the words. But we also need the living out. 
See, we, are, we have been called to be an ambassador. And an, as being an ambassador for the Lord, it does involve what we say. But I think there's a component, component that we miss. It's, it's how we live our lives. And don't, don't stay with me. Don't run off to thinking what you... Because again, I'm not talking about what you do in the sense of how you live, how you dress, that kind of thing. It would be a great honor to be an ambassador to South Africa. It'd be a great honor to be a, 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 a ambassador to any nation. It is a great honor. But we already have the greatest honor of all because we are the ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, the one who created the sun that we see out there, the one who created the stars, the moon, the gazillion galaxies, I mean, they don't even know how many galaxies that are out there, the one who created everything that we see, we have been called to be an ambassador for the one who created everything. There can be no greater honor than to be an ambassador for Christ. We're, we are an ambassador of the one from which everything exists, everything revolves around. You and I, now again, not, not in the sense of condemnation, the question I would ask is what kind of an ambassador are we? When we talk about being an ambassador, we think about what we say. Let me give you a couple of other scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. Everybody say power. Okay. Maybe one more time. Say power. power. So as an ambassador for Christ, what we speak is important. But the power that we operate under is as important as well. In case you struggle with what Paul has to say, let me read what Jesus said you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God say power of so as you live a supernatural lifestyle it is it, what you say and sometimes it seems like I'm overemphasizing the what we do rather than what we say I don't want you to misunderstand me what we say is important the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is important However, I think there's also the power side of it. And I think the power side of it is one of the ways, and it's not the only way, but it is one way that people are drawn to Christ. Now, I need my wonderful volunteers to come help me, if you would. Yeah, yeah come, on, come on up so everybody can see you. See, a supernatural lifestyle, it moves you along what I call, it's, it's the Engel scale. It's E-N-G-L-E. Uh, it's, it, I read this in a book in the 70s. It was called What's Gone Wrong with the Harvest. It was about, uh, I know this is going to be traumatic for some of you. How many of you remember your days in math class? Anybody experience trauma from that? We'll do inner healing at the end. But imagine, and I'm sorry, what's your name? Nick. Nick. Hair, yeah, just brush. Uh, hairbrush guy, Nick, he is going to be Jesus on the cross. Use your sanctified imagination. So, this is a 30-minute illustration, by the way. <laughs> and what is your name? Panita. Panita. Panita? Panita. Mel. Mel and Pranita. Pranita, I want you to stand right here. And Nell? Mel. Mel. All right, you're on the left side over here. Here is zero, the point where a person accepts Jesus, and then... After they accept Jesus, uh, you know, the math, the, the number line, 0 plus 1 plus 2 on into an infinity, plus 1 plus 2, and a person grows until they go to be with the Lord. All right, back here. And then we have male. The, the minus side shows you how far a person is away from the Lord. Say male, she's not too bad of a person. She's not at a minus 1. She's at a minus 10. How do you get her from being a minus 10 to the point of the cross where she accepts Jesus as her Savior. What, what do you do? Well, you invite her. Do you have Christmas pageants here, Easter pageants? Well, you invite her to those kinds of things, special socials. 
when one of her four children is sick, um, or is it five? One of her five children is sick. And um, in America, we take potato soup or chicken soup over, you know, to be kind and help out. And do you have, do you have any kind of custom where you take food over when people are sick? No? Okay. It, what, what do you take over? Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so y you do things, acts of kindness, and all of these are important. Every, every, everything that I'm talking about is important. But acts of kindness and, and doing things, and she gets to the place where she's at a minus one. She's ready, <laughs> ready to accept Jesus as her Savior. Now, you still need to give the message of the cross to her. You need to still talk about the implications of accepting Jesus. And she accepts Jesus and then moves on into plus one and plus two. And uh, let me stand behind and help keep Jesus on the cross. <laughs> We want to make sure that Jesus doesn't come off the cross. I usually look for the most muscular bodybuilder I can find. I didn't do it this time, sorry. Uh, but, but imagine that male is not minus 10. She's not a minus 20. I mean, she's, she's almost off the edge of the earth. She's at a minus 100. I mean, she's about too far to save. How do you get her from this point to there? You can still do the other things. You can come over and bring food. You can come over and help take care of one of her eight children. Um, her family has grown. Uh, let's just say she's got 12 kids. Uh, you can do those kinds of things. But what if one of her 12 children has cancer and the doctors have, have said, there's no way that child is going to live, that child is going to die They've, they've actually pronounced a death sentence. They only have weeks to live. And we've seen people given six weeks to live. You're not going to help Jesus stay on the cross? Okay. <laughs> we've seen people who have been given six weeks to live and Jesus heals them and they're totally healed. They're, and, and, and within weeks, their body's functioning normally. They look great. So we've seen that happen. What if you go over and not just take some good food to help the family during this time of crisis. You ask, can I pray for your little girl or your little boy? And you lay hands on that little boy or that little girl and they get healed. What, are you what do you think is going to happen to this person who is at a minus 100? They're going to want to know what happened. What, what power did you use? What, how did you get my daughter healed when they said that that, per that daughter was going to die? When you tell them about Jesus, they're going to move from there to here it, it, and it it's, it's power evangelism. It's Wimber's power evangelism. You still need to talk to her about the implications of the, the gospel, the message. You still need to talk to... The, what you say is still important. But it's the power of God that got them from that point to this point. All right, if you'll hold up Jesus' arm over there. and you, All right, Mel, you're going to hold Jesus' arm up here. And now we have Jesus and the two thieves on the cross. Um, and which one of the thieves go to paradise? We're not going to vote. In my story, both of them make it. So thank you, guys. You're free to go. Uh, now, I want to give you a real live illustration of this. We were in uh, India as a number of years ago. I, I'd already started working for Global, but I think it was right at the very beginning. And we were doing an outdoor crusade. There's several thousand people there. Uh, at night, we would do the outdoor crusade. And then during the day, we would do training of pastors and leaders. And so it was Randy's time to speak. Randy was doing training. There's probably 400 people there. And there was this big door off to the right. And um, it was open. There was no, it, where people could look in. And there was a, a Muslim, mu Muslim, two Muslim women out there listening because they weren't allowed to come in. A full burqa. Um, and they were just standing outside listening what was going on. Randy walks out the door. We walk out the door. And one of them, the youngest one, stops Randy and says, Can you help my mother-in-law? She has a demon. I always look at the men when I say this. <laughs> so 
So men, look at me. Don't look to your right or to your left if your mother-in-law is with you. <laughs> Said, can you help my mother? My mother-in-law has a demon. And so Randy brings a team over. They start praying with her. And I don't remember whether Randy asked her or if she volunteered or it was a word of knowledge. I don't remember. But she had a problem with her knee. Randy prays for her knee. The knee gets healed. The woman gets delivered. We think that's the end of the story. We go back to the uh, crusade that night. It's an outdoor crusade. We got this big, huge stage on the, uh, I mean, it's very tall. They, they build them where people can see at a distance. Uh, some chairs, but most everybody has to sit. And so I was on the stage just sort of looking, and I was, you know, just walking on the stage, seeing what the Lord was doing. And just, I was doing a little video in it at that time and just trying to get some shots. And I saw, it was at the beginning because some of the chairs were open, I saw this Muslim family walk in from the back, walk all the way down to the front, and they filled in like two whole rows. And it was the mother in law and the daughter had gone back told the patriarch of the family told the father what had happened and he brought he got his whole household they all came to hear what what was going on with this jesus thing so there they're sitting we were giving words of knowledge and when we do words of knowledge we ask if you know to stand when you get when there's a word of knowledge for you one of the first ones that stood was the father of that family and then we ask you to wave if you get 80% healed. One of the first ones that waved his arms was the father, the patriarch. So he went, back, he went back, they went back, got the father. He brought his, theologically, your pastors can deal with this later. But he got his wives. <laughs> and they all came. And then different ones of the family were standing, waving. They had gotten healed. Randy gives the, he spoke that night, he gave the altar call for salvation. And it sounds almost like, I'm, it's almost like it's an overstatement, but it happened exactly like this. One of the first ones that stood up was that father. When he stood up, his whole family stood up. They all came down to the front and gave their hearts to the Lord. Why? Was it because of the message? No, it was because of the power of God. It was because of a deliverance. It was because a knee was healed. It was because the father had been healed. We stayed in touch with the apostolic overseer uh, in that place for, for quite some time. And they, he told us, he said, they went back and their whole area of the city, sort of one of the villages on the outskirts of the, of the city, said their whole area, even the crops were blessed. So they went back. They didn't know that you, you weren't supposed to heal the sick. They didn't know you weren't, they hadn't been in church yet. So they didn't know that you weren't supposed to heal the sick or cast out demons or do those other things. So they went back, took the message of the gospel, and they walked out their walk as Jesus did, and they began to see their whole region turn into revival. Why? Was it because we tried to talk them into accepting the gospel and there's nothing wrong with that? No, it was because of the demonstration of the power. When you go out, on the streets or at the market and you see someone who has a need or Holy Spirit speaks to you. So many times we're saying get thee behind us Satan when it's not Satan, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. He's saying why don't you just ask that woman with the cane if you can pray for her or the person with the, with the crutches or the person in the wheelchair. Just ask them. One of the things that we need to do, and I, I talk about this in another message, is learn to overcome our fear about stepping out, to learn to be risk takers. I, I think life as Jesus wanted it to be was a life of risk. It was, it's a life of, in fact, if we're going to walk out life as Jesus did, it'll be, it'll be a life of risk. Now, I'm not going to have time to cover the second point. Actually, this has five points, but I never get beyond two. This lifestyle is only possible as we allow Jesus to live his life through us. See, when I'm talking about making yourself available, I'm not talking about working up. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to live a supernatural lifestyle. It's basically getting up in the morning and saying, Lord, today I am filled with you and I'm available to do whatever you want whenever you want me to do it. If you have divine appointments for me, I'm ready. 
I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to walk out my life. And Lord, you, you point out those divine appointments that you've already set up for me. And so it's not something that we try to work up. It's just living our lives full of him. Does that, does that make sense? It's just being filled with him. So we can only live this lifestyle if we allow Jesus to live his life through us. There was a, it's 9.15, correct? I still have 10 minutes. 9.15 is when I'm supposed to be finished. Yeah, okay. Um, there was a, one of our first trips to, to Brazil was in 2001 or two, 2001. And on that trip, uh, Bill Johnson's brother, uh, Bob, uh, took some, a few, very few people. There was like a hundred and something people on the trip. But he took a few uh, to the streets to minister to the prostitutes. Two of the girls that went were from my church. And Pat and a and, um, couple of guys went to help protect, to just to be there to support. They came back. Radically changed, very excited about what God, what they saw God do, ministering to the prostitutes. We go back a year later, and almost a year later, and again, I took people from my church with me to Brazil, and I said, I want to do what you guys did when you were here last time. I want to go out and minister to the prostitutes on the street. So we went to this area in Sao Paulo, and the way we did this is... Um, sounds a strange way of ministry, but we bought roses. And, and the girls were the ones that were doing the ministry. The guys were there just for protection. I was much... You don't believe me. But I was in a little better shape than, back then than I am now. And so they would go up to the girls, and they would give them a rose, and they would say something like, smell the rose. Doesn't it smell great? Isn't the rose beautiful? And then they would talk, generally speaking, they would talk about the beauty of the rose. And then at, at some point, they would say, and that's how the Father in heaven sees you. Almost, without exception. I, I think I could say 100% of the time. I'm sure it wasn't. But as far as my memory goes, almost every one of those girls broke out in tears because they didn't feel loved. They felt abused. They felt taken advantage of. They felt... Um, rejected by the church. In fact, we had an experience where one of them we invited, the church didn't want to let her in. And I had to go and stop them and say, no, we invited her to come. Almost without exception. And, and then throughout the next week, week and a half, there were times that we would go, the team, the, the ones who were involved in this, there was only eight of us, I think, total, four guys and four girls. And we would try to do some training with them and minister to them. And then there was one time they, they, most, a lot of them looked young. I mean, and some of them were very young. But we were uh, ministering, and I know I'm going to move out of the light of the TV, but just for one moment. We went down to this place in front of a church to do some training, and there was one girl that looked like she was about 15 years old. And it just broke my heart. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, um, to do something that on the surface seemed very inappropriate. And so I went over and I took her by the hand. And I said, you have nothing that I want, but the father just told me to come over and kiss your hand. So I just bent down and kissed her hand. And that little girl came unglued. She's weeping, she's shaking, she's crying. And she's saying, I've never had a father. My daddy never loved me. Will you be my daddy? Will you be my father? Will you be my daddy? And, I, and she just, just, she's just weeping and shaking. And I said, no, sweetheart, I can't be your father. I don't live here. But there is a father in heaven that loves you and is going to watch after you if you will commit your heart to him, if you will follow him. She gave me a, a little plaque uh, before I left. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't very valuable. But it's one of the most valuable gifts that I've ever received. I still have it given to me in 2001, I, I, and because of what it did to my heart. And as we were about to leave, it was time for us to come back to the States. Uh, our, we were following the girls over to say bye to their girls, and as we get to the place, to the hotel where they worked out of, they're running toward our girls, our girls are running toward them, and they exchange gifts and phone numbers and um, just we're giving them Bibles. and I, I Just the, the celebration of... of getting to know these girls. 
And I, I'm following behind them because my, I've just been wrecked by what I saw happen with these girls. And the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to my heart. Where would Jesus be if he was here today on earth? Where, where would he be? And then it was followed up with, would he be behind the bright lights of the famous TV, Christian TV programs of the day? Would he be behind the stained glass windows of the most beautiful buildings on the earth? If Jesus were here today, where would he be? And then I heard this voice say, Jesus is here today because he's here through you. See, when Jesus was here on earth in physical form, he was, could be at one location at one time. If he was where this, uh, the woman of uh, Caesarea was, he was there. In the region of Tyre and Sidon, he was there. He was not in Rome if he was there. But Jesus lived out his life here. He died on the cross for us. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven at the right hand of the Father. He sent Holy Spirit down to live in us. And so today, Jesus is not only on the streets of Sao Paulo. He's also on the streets of Johannesburg. He's on the streets of New York. He's on the streets of L.A., the streets of San Francisco. Because he is there through us. See, you and I are here to represent him. We are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. I'm going to try that over here. That was a good point. <laughs> we are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. And, and, and people will develop their, their beliefs. They'll develop their feelings. They'll, they'll have their um, uh, even emotional uh, enlightenment depending on what kind of a representative we are. Again, not many's guilt, just an awareness of... See, we're sometimes waiting, and I think there is going to come a time of revival where fish jump into the boat. But we're waiting for the fish to jump into the boat when Jesus is saying, no, go catch the fish. You, you go catch them. Go bait the hook, the, the hook with love. I was in Colombia three years ago. I've, I've, time runs together. I travel about 220, 240 days a year, so it all runs together. Um, so I think it was three years ago we were in a church in Colombia. And um, this is a large church, and they provided food for us. And every night after the service, we'd go upstairs to where the food was. And I've learned that you take care of of the people who feed you. So when I, when I would go in, the person who prepared the food, I would give her a big hug. You know, I was just doing it out of you know, appreciation, that kind of a thing, did it every night. The last night that we were about to leave, she brought the um, missionary, the English-speaking uh, English missionaries, and came and said, and she's weeping, and she said, before you came, she said, I was rejected by my father. And she said, my father never loved me. And she said, my father rejected me. And she said, I was praying before you came for a father's hug, for a daddy's hug. And she said, the Lord spoke to me and said that every time you hugged me, I was getting my father's love, of my daddy's hug, my father's hug. And then she said, can I have another daddy's hug? And I said, yes, you can. And I gave her this big hug, and she's just weeping. And I have really nice shirts, by the way, really nice shirts. <laughs> and when she left, there was a spot about this big that wasn't all tears. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't care. She gave me a coffee cup. I, I use it almost every morning. I'm at home now called Mia Papa, my daddy. And that, that woman was so transformed by, see, it's one of the greatest gifts you can give at times is the gift of a hug. Did you know that people can be healed with a hug? They can be healed with a hug. And transformed, and now she's, one, she's in one of the leaders in the church. And she stayed in touch, we stay in touch, and she still calls me her papa, her daddy. Represent the Father's love by what you say, by operating in power, and by what you do.